I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby here with Anna Sawai, who was just nominated for lead actress in a drama series uh, for her role on Shogun. And and Anna, you know, we as we were recording, we're recording this. It's just hours after the Emmy nomination. So I'm curious if you've had time to kind of digest and wrap your head around uh, the good news this morning. Not really. I haven't had time. I feel like it happened and I was rushed to a video shoot and then I had um, three interviews, one that was two hours. And so now I'm just like back here. I did have a brief call with my mom and that was kind of when we were like celebrating together. But um, yeah, it's it feels like it, it just got announced 15 minutes ago and I'm still processing it. Well, I, I think about the year you've had between both Shogun and and Monarch Legacy of Monsters, which I absolutely adore. Um, and and I'm I'm just curious is what has this has this world, whole entire year pretty much been a whirlwind for you? Yeah, I feel like everything just happened so quickly back to back. Monarch came out. Um, we were doing press last December, and then now this is happening. And then, I mean, after the release, where we started doing press for you know for your consideration and all that stuff. And so, I haven't really had time to really sit back and like look at it from a different point of view. I'm just kind of in it, and I know for sure that later on I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, we did so much and so much was happening, but I didn't know half of it. So I I don't know. I just kind of want to. I wish I could just see it from an outside point of view and appreciate it a little bit more. Not that I'm not appreciative, but it's just happening so quickly. Well, this, you know, you had to live with Lady Marico. I believe the shooting was about 10 months, am I right? It was 10 months, yes. And, and so living with a character that long is not something that a lot of actors get to do unless they're doing like a long run in a play or something like that. So living with this character for that long and the time after still talking about her, uh, does she still kind of feel real to you? Does she still feel like a part of you or does she feel like somebody else, like just a good friend? I think that she'll always have a very special place in me. I thought that I had said goodbye to the character when we wrapped because the day after I went on to a different set, but talking about her in press, I realized how how deeply it affected me and how much I had still been carrying. And it was weird because at one point when the when her last episode had aired, I called her Mariko Sama in some interview and I was like, wait, I've never called her Sama because that's like saying Miss Anna Sawai, which you, you don't do, right? And it felt to me like that was when I finally kind of let her go. But at the same time, she was so, she really brought out a different side of me artistically. And I, I kind of like, have this different view on my work now. And so I'll always carry her and she'll always be this very precious, important figure. And I'll probably look back at the experience being like, look, I was able to do this. I'm also looking for more deep stuff like Mariko's story. And um, yeah, I'll always be, I don't want to compare any characters with each other, but I know for sure I will because she was so, so impactful. And I think one of the one of the great things about this character, um, and so much of it is due to not just your performance, but the writing as well and the way it's shot, is that for so much of the show, she is an internal character. So she she has to keep so much in, and yet you as the actor have to communicate that with just looks. And so how much work went into creating just her as or just her face of, of of communicating those emotions it wasn't I never had to think about oh I'm not supposed to express it blah 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 it was more it it came naturally because I think Japanese people especially women are ingrained to do that that's that's our culture people aren't as open as westerners are and um, I already knew that it was within me and so it was funny because now it's funny to me but when we were shooting it I didn't understand 
what I was going through. And so I would feel like I wasn't giving it enough. Even though I was feeling all the emotions, I felt like, oh, I'm not expressing enough. I'm not doing it enough. But it was all part of the character. And I was just living through her. And so it, and now I know that it was okay, but I was struggling a lot for until episode, the last bit of episode eight, I felt like I was so stuck. And I felt like um, I needed, so I needed someone to tell me that I was doing okay, but I really felt like I wasn't, unfortunately. And, and, and well, and I was, was it, was Hiroyuki Sonata, was, was Hiro the one to kind of tell you that? Hero was definitely the person to tell me that. I also reached out to Rachel Kondo. I felt like she really understood the character and um, she was such a big influence to me. And so I would go to different people at different times and just be like, look, you got to tell me what to do. They'd be like, no, that's exactly what Monica was feeling. So don't sweat it. But it was hard to believe then. And I still... You know, it's it's weird when people praise my performance because I still don't believe that it was my performance. It really is the creators that wrote this beautiful character who has so much, um, just so, is so complicated, has so many layers, and it it was them, you know. So, yeah, it feels like it feels like an award that should be going to the creators and writers, but. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just grateful that all the burden that I was feeling, all the self-doubt that I was feeling probably meant that I was doing the character right. <laughs> well, and I think that internal stuff, I think that connects to, to the release that we finally see in Crimson Sky in, in episode nine, um, and really that fight scene, um, mm -hmm which is one of the most gripping scenes, I think, of the season. It's very memorable. People just keep talking about it. How much went into creating that moment? We had been training for a long time before the shoot even started from Japan to Vancouver. And then once the shoot was going on, we were still training. And so by the time that we were at episode nine, I didn't feel like I had to do specific training to get ready for it. It was more learning the choreo. But like you said, Mariko is such an introspective character that when she's allowed to release, it's so much more meaningful. And I was so happy to be able to play with that. She was given permission to physically fight, to verbally express and just to take action. And that was everything that was bought, you know, like boiling up within her till that moment. And so... Um, when we came to that scene, I was feeling very liberated and I was not feeling the self-doubt that I was feeling episodes before that. Um, Fred, who directed it, was just so, he was like, he really trusted in me and I felt that and I think I needed that too, to for me to be allowed to play in the way that Mariko is allowed to just burst. So um, everything felt really good in that scene. Well, it, you have so many moments in that episode, I assume, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I assume, I realize it's the day of the nominations, but I assume that will be your submission. I guess so. I I mm -hmm. mean, Crimson Sky has been um, nominated for the episode and also has Anjin, which is the first episode. So yeah, it has been submitted. Yeah, but well, it... it, it as the lead, as a as an acting nominee, you submit an episode to uh, to Emmy voters. And... Oh, I didn't know that. Wait, <laughs> know that this is the first time I have been nominated for the Emmys. I did not consider the awards when we were shooting this. I'm I'm you know being introduced to this now, so I did not know about that. Um, thank you for teaching me. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm in that scene, yeah. But to me, to me, it, it's it's bookended by these two really powerful scenes, uh, the, 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 the scene of you against the door uh, at the very end. Uh, I'm curious in that moment, um, do you think that, that Mariko knows that that was ultimately going to be the end or did she just go into this knowing that somewhere along this journey to the castle to try and release, get everybody released, that this was going to be her end? 
I don't think she knew it. Um, I think that her ultimate goal was just to serve the Lord, which was to get the people out. Um, and so that was, you know, the big uh, Naginata scene that she had. She knew that she wasn't going to be, probably knew that she wasn't going to be permitted to leave. And that would have been a message to everyone that they are being taken hostage. And that is one of her missions to prove that, right? Um, and then when she's given permission to leave, then that is already like the goal almost. So she feels that she is going to leave, but then she is stopped and she cannot be captured because then she's not um, able to keep the keep the mission going forward. And so that's when she stands in front of the door. And in that moment, yes, she does realize that this is the way to go, that she is um, claiming that they are to indeed taken hostage. She is also following the footsteps of her father and fulfilling her Lord's purpose, uh, Lord's mission. And so um, in the moment that she doesn't know, but I don't think that she ever thought that this might happen. Mm -hmm. Does, yeah. does her, her connection to Tornaga, I mean, so many of the scenes between you and Hero, there is so much, uh, there's such a, there's such a subliminal connection between these two characters, like they completely understand each other and yet they know their place. What is it that, what is it about Torganaga that, that Maiko is, is so connected to him? I feel that she, she sees that he is one of the very few people who did not misunderstand her father. And that is the biggest burden for her is to have to live with the shame that people people think that the fa her father was wrong. Um, he did he deserved the death that he had, and to her the fact that Toranaga-sama sees that you know the father did it for a right reason. Possibly he doesn't verbally say it, but she does believe that he thinks that. I think is something that she's very. Um, she feels seen and he is the Lord. And I think during that time, whatever the Lord says, you do. Um, so even though she is a Christian and she has that dual consciousness of being Chris Christian, but also um, a samurai, um, she will always follow her Lord's orders um, before taking uh, the religion, if that makes sense. No, I, I, I think, I think there's there's such a clear understanding between the two of them um, that never even has to be communicated. I'm just curious. I'm curious as to how much you and Hero talked about the relationship between between the two of them. Right. Actually, can I just add to the last thing? I don't sure. think she's being um, samurai over Christianity because she does want to die. Um, a, a what is it like um a loyal samurai but also still with the cross so um she's not picking one over the other but um she will always listen to the lord is kind of what i was going at um how we built the connection i think that to me hero was what toranaga-sama was to mariko he was someone who i I wanted to make him proud. Like I was coming in really new and um, not that I was, you know, only doing it for that, but like I wanted him to know that I could do it. And I was willing to learn from him because I knew that he, he could give me the best advice and he was always there for that. And he took time out of his weekend to make sure that I felt comfortable and confident in the work that I was doing. Um, I really respect his work and um yeah like I respect him as a human and he was just he was the best number one that you could ask for so much of what you have to do in this show is so technical because you know you're you're switching between languages you're embodying somebody from centuries ago and the languages that the language that you're using is not even traditional you know, mm -hmm. current contemporary Japanese, it's more like the Japanese version of Shakespeare, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And so how, what was the, what was the, uh, the learning curve like for you to, to, to attack this and keep it all in your head? I feel like it helped that I didn't have any period experience in a way, in a way, it would have been lovely if I already had experience, 
but I had nothing. So I really felt like a sponge and that whatever they taught me, I could really, like I was a plain canvas. Um, and so I knew that I had to learn everything from scratch, from the way that I talk to carrying myself to what I'm wearing um, and just physically getting into everything um, really allowed me to shape the character. And I felt like I wasn't myself anymore when I wore her clothes and I wore that wig and I was walking onto set in, in these shuffling steps. So it was great that I didn't really have myself anymore. It was like, I was just lost into the character. Does it, did it make it that much more difficult to get out of it once you were done with it? People keep asking me this question and I feel like, I feel like it's not, it wasn't as hard getting out of it because I had to force myself to become a different character the next day after wrapping. Um, so maybe, maybe I didn't do the whole like cleansing thing <laughs> enough. And maybe that's why I still carry her. And that's why I still get emotional when I talk about specific scenes or what she was going through. But um, no, it wasn't, it wasn't as hard because I really, I really had to take on a different character the next day. I, I wanted to ask about uh, just a scene that's just one of my favorites. The scene with Mariko and her husband where, you know, he she basically, I read a comment somewhere that it's like, how do you say I don't love you without saying I don't love you? Um, I feel like that scene, did you look at that scene and go, ooh, this is going to be fun? Oh, I don't think I looked at it as fun. Look, here, I'm going to be honest. Nothing about the show was fun. It was <laughs> all very heavy and very serious. Um, the people I love, but it wasn't like a joyful, let's go to work, at least for me, because it, I, I, I had that pressure on me. Um, I looked at it as this is the moment that she gets to be honest with her husband. And they weren't they weren't allowed to do that back in the day but he is kind of reaching out a hand and kind of allowing her to say it in that moment and she knows that they're about to possibly you know die after this and so i love that she gets to stand up for herself and tell him exactly what she's thinking and that he doesn't deserve that from her because throughout her whole the marriage he has tied her down and so I was looking forward to that scene. I knew that it was going to be a beautiful scene, but I also knew all the technical stuff that we had to work on. And it was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was 25 minutes if we did from the top of the scene to the end. And we did it multiple times and we were drinking the matcha and doing all the stuff. And so it was a long, long shoot, but I think it was so beautifully shot. And, um, abe -sang, who played Buntaro, was great to play off of. Um, so I'm so grateful for to be to have been able to do that long scene. Well, I, just to kind of finish up here, this th this character has has really touched nerves. I mean, if you go on YouTube, you can see these people just reacting to this character and reacting to what she does, and and she's such a. a, a I, I really hate to use the term strong female, but she has clearly touched a nerve with people. Um, what what do you think it is about, about Monaco that, that just captivates people like this? I think that um, when you say strong female, it's not like she's not unrealistically strong. You know, it's that core within her that is so apparent but also she's so hurt and she's broken and she's she's been through so much and yet she's still like standing up and it's not an easy stand you know she's struggling to stand up and i think that a lot of women even men um understand that feeling you know it's not easy but still finding that a way to maybe keep moving forward um i think maybe that's what struck a chord with everyone um i don't know yeah, she's she was just beautifully written. Well, Anna, congratulations on everything, the TCA award, uh, you know, the Emmys, and 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 
your multiple gold derby nominations, I might add. Um, might, thank you. I can't believe, what well, is it? Newcomer and- a Breakthrough performer, performer of the year, lead actress, and as part of the ensemble. You guys are just being nice. <laughs> Seriously. Well, our users, our users feel it's very well deserved. And uh, for the record, so do I. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions uh, for the upcoming Emmys and stay tuned for interviews with more Emmy nominees uh, in the coming weeks. Anna Sawai, congratulations. A really great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.